Welcome to our virtual conversation. Uh, my name is Elizabeth McIntyre um, and I am the co-director of Screencraft Works along with my colleague Rebecca Del Tufo who is also here this evening. Um, first of all a hearty thank you to our sponsors Genelec. Um, thank you for supporting this series of uh, cross-border conversation talks. Um, thank you also uh, to our mentor scheme partners, Brunel University London, who are operating the technical management of the talks. And of course, to our speakers, room hosts and participants. Um, so what is Screencraft Works all about? We're a not-for-profit virtual community for cross-border knowledge share and a chance to widen your networks across local borders um, and international borders. And it's for all production and post-production people. And in terms of the cross-border conversations, this is a chance where for experts to share their knowledge and their insights between those who are at different career stages and from different countries. And speakers are drawn from our mentoring group. So I'm delighted to hand over to editor Tomiko Hirasoya, who is our host this evening. Over to you, Tomiko. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to host this event. I'm Tomoko Hirasawa. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a Japanese editor based in the UK, Spain, and Japan. I'm currently working for Change.org, and I edit unscripted films, commercials, and online content. Editing has been my passion for the last 20 years, and to me, it's a wonderful job to pursue. Today, we've got two legendary editors with us with decades of experience in British and international films and TV. Paul Martin Smith, we call you Martin, and we have Chris Wyatt. Thank you for giving us your time today, and it's really great to have you both here. Um, so could you give us a little introduction to tell everyone who you are? Would you like to go first, Chris? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris Wyatt, um, I'm a, a film editor, uh, and I've uh, been doing it for, um, uh, well, more years than I care to remember. Um, and um, way back uh, in the day, I used to work as Martin's assistant. And uh, prior to that, I used to neg cut um, lots of um, commercials and uh, documentaries for Martin as well. So we had, uh, we've had a, a long, uh, a long uh, sort of uh, professional <laughs> relationship over the years. Thank you. Um, Martin, would you like to say hi to the audience? Hey, hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Paul Martin Smith, Martin. Um, and I've been uh, in the film business since 67. Uh, uh, first in the camera department and then uh, uh, went over to editing and uh, edited everything from music videos, news items, documentaries, commercials and features. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> so um, let's get started with a very important question. Um, what inspired you to have a career in editing? Which one of you want to go first? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 um, I think from a very, very early age, I felt I had, I, I had the um, desire to work in the industry, but I didn't quite know as what. Um, and, um, and and it, it transpired that if I looked at all the jobs that were available, I wouldn't actually be any good at any of them because it seemed that there would be a certain um, prerequisite skill in something else. Um, but then I read somewhere about um, editing, and editing was described as somebody who um, decides how much of a black car and a white car you show in a car chase. And so I just thought, well, how difficult can that be? Um, <laughs> and so it was just one of those... One of those things, but retrospectively, what happened for me was that I found that, you know, it became about, um, you know, it, it was much more about uh, thinking and uh, dealing with a different kind of application. So you didn't actually need to have a, a physical skill. You know, Martin saying that he worked from the camera department. I didn't have any urge to go down that particular route. So it was good for me that he was something he was something that was more it was more about um uh, an intellectual idea rather than a, a, a different kind of skill set that was needed. And you, Martin, so you worked in camera department before you started working <laughs> in the cutting room. What made you go that direction? Well, um, it's, it's, it's rather complicated. I, I 
was in in theater first of all in school and and uh, found my niche there and um, <clears throat> and uh, after I was uh, left school I was hitchhiking across the east coast I came back home and um, decided somehow I wanted to get into something or other I wasn't sure what but I was down in a shop buying some pants <laughs> And the uh, phone rang there and there was an assistant who said uh, across to the, to the owner, hey, John, we've got somebody who uh, needs a runner on a film. And I went, I'll do that. <laughs> and ended up as a runner. And the, uh, the DP was a German guy called George Vollmer, who I absolutely adored. And um, he took me on as his assistant cameraman, uh, mainly 16. And for two years, we shot around uh, Washington, um, basically news items and White House stuff and stuff like that. Um, and then I produced a documentary, which again won some awards called The Animals Are Crying. And the editor was the, an editor for um, uh, Robert Kennedy back in the days when way back early when they were you know, um, doing political broadcasts. And, uh, I noticed, you know, what he was doing. So I decided from that moment on, I had to become an editor. And I flew out to uh, Britain because I grew up most of my life in Europe anyway, and uh, spent two years trying to get into the business and ended up uh, finding uh, a guy called Martin Bowen, who was a great guy, who was an editor. And I was going to be his assistant for no pay. And, um, and eventually, I actually started cutting a year later. I, I always, I always wondered if that was folklore or not, because I remember oh. you saying that. No, no, no. But, but wasn't it that you actually had a set? You, you said that you'd have a little set rate for every new, every new thing you learned. Well, what something? happened? What happened was after a few months, he felt guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so then he started saying, "Okay, you're going to get ten pounds for you know if you can sync up rushes, and you know ten pounds for if you make sure in the morning you call the lab to find out where the APs are. This is a commercial company." Um, and uh, in the end, we were so fast, we would we would blow clients away. <laughs> how fast we were. But uh, yeah, basically, he I, he became one of my best friends, and it was Barry Leith who was directing uh, stop motion stuff too. It was a part of the group, and uh, I ended up by uh, uh, cutting all his uh, commercials and ading. I was also ading at the same time. Yeah, well, I remember <laughs> that also in um, when, years later when we went and did um, Arctic Heat, the old Born American. And yeah. the, you were the whole second unit stuff and actually got most of what, well, actually all the good action stuff as well. But well, it was interesting because, you know, Rene, Rene Harlan was his, his, he was called Larry Haryola then, if you recall. And um, we ended up in uh, Helsinki and um, he fired two ADs, you know, after one after the other. And he called me up in the middle of the night and said, Martin, I want you to come and AD this picture for me because he knew I was ADing uh, music videos and things like that and then cutting them. And um, <laughs> I said, but I'm, you know, cut the movie. We have to cut the movie. He said, oh, we do that later. So I ended up with the last half of the movie <laughs> uh, ADing it and also second unit directing and camera work too. <laughs> really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. So now we are going to look at some scenes or, uh, from films that Martin and Chris have worked on. And after each clip, we will discuss the process behind it. And I wanted to start with, uh, with, uh, with a big one, the 1999 box office number one film, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Um, Martin, this is the film you edited. Would you like to tell us? Yeah, there's a pre let me preempt it to an extent. Um, this is a scene that I've, we chose this scene because it was six hours worth of rushes. They shot 33,000 feet. And uh, because young Jake um, wasn't particularly good at mem remembering his lines, but George kept on turning over. And um, so there were little bits here and little bits there and it was all over the place. So in the end, <clears throat> the most important line, they actually because of all the, the, the craziness in the, in the whole thing, they missed the most important line, which was um, 
So uh, it's in the middle. Of, it's in the middle of the clip. He says, "So are you a Jedi?" And then, um, so we had to go back and pick that up three days later or four days later or something like that. And um, then the, the, also the other thing is, is George during the cut was saying, "Geez, you know, at the end, I wish I had a, I, had, I wish I had a look from a young Anakin." And um, he, he looked. To, he looks over at uh, at, uh, at Liam. So we didn't have that shot, but we had it. So I reversed it, put a head on top of the, his body and had a smile put on there. So it's a completely made up shot, which George came in and said, where did you find that? I said, we made it up. <laughs> so. When I knew you were going to be showing this, I was trying to put myself in a similar position and try and think, what is there? I mean, I've never, I've never had the forgetting a line thing, but which is just, you know, that's really great. Um, but um, but certainly a scene of that length and of that magnitude with that kind of coverage. And um, there was a scene for me in um, a film called um, This Is England, where in the middle of the film is quite a crucial scene, which shifts the whole emphasis of the film. And again, there was just so much footage, so much coverage. And I just remember for days putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and thinking, yeah. there's this thing that's sitting there, it's waiting for me. I just, I know I have to address yeah. it. Yeah. And then thinking, okay, it's now going to be today and I, rem I remember that decision but I cannot remember a single editorial decision that I made while doing it it's what yes. it's that whole thing about you go into this other place yes. and I remember the going in and I remember coming out the other end being shattered but I actually cannot remember any <laughs> any part of the actual process and I just yes. wonder the same for you and also Tomiko as well a documentary where you're always dealing with vast amounts of footage as well I mean I just you know that that whole thing about where do you start? How do you start? What's the way in? All that kind of stuff. I'm not just curious, you know, just know how that works. The other thing is, is looking at a scene years later, a couple of years later or whatever, and going, why did that look so complicated? Why was that so complicated at the time? Look at it. It works. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because you have no recollection of how it went. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I think that... Uh, when you talk about how much footage you go into it, you just got to start assembling stuff. You just put it together slowly. And I, I do exactly the same as you, Chris. I, I put off stuff. I mean, fortunately, I didn't put off that particular scene because we had <laughs> the, the line missing, which I went, oh my God, we're missing that line. Are we sure? We're looking for it everywhere. But there's certain scenes that I'll just, you know, this stuff will start coming in and I'll just leave it and leave it. And you got production and things like that sometimes saying, where's that scene? You need to sort of draw it in. You need to dream about it. You need to, you know, you need to have it take a shower about it. You know, you need to, all that stuff. And then slowly it's sort of, well, yeah, I could do, you know, that's, okay, what do we, you know, and you, and then, and then you start building it that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking because again, what one of the one of the major things as well about this, because you know, this period for us, this was a huge kind of transitional change where we were going from a very mechanical way of working into the you know digitized, mm -hmm. computerized uh, time. We're now so readily doing those kinds of things of actually manipulating. Totally. moments but, but totally. even just a fraction but not even the whole frame totally. and I think that's also what's interesting about that because again that would have been very early on in I mean I remember, I remember about that time um when visual effects were just about starting and so um uh, uh post house or the, those sort of computer places were just sort of doing uh, weather replacement you know swapping yes. out skies that kind of thing and that's the first time I heard the word terabyte and you know going to this room and there's this massive you know machine which had you know hundreds of terabytes and I thought wow that's amazing you know and here we are sitting with you know five terabytes on the desk you know it's just <laughs> it's, but we know times change blah 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 but it, but I think it's important because obviously these these things factor in and 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 all that stuff has to start somewhere. And to, uh, to my thinking, that shot that you conjured up, that's one of the earliest recollections I think I can think of where you were not only, you know, you were actually breaking down a, 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 a character. So, you know, sticking, yeah. changing eyes, changing a face, change, changing a head, whatever. So it's actually, this, it's a wonderfully kind of liberating thing because we're no longer, because we both come from a, a period where, you believe that what came out the camera was what you had. 
Mm -hmm. And that's what you had to work with. And then that's all now changed because you now look at something and you kind of think, well, it just doesn't have to be this anymore. Mm. You know, it, it, it can be anything you want it to be. Which that's is interesting because it, it, that film with George, it was like we were talking about, it was like playing 3D chess. There were takes that we were taking, take two of, of, of one, one bit, of one character in the same shot and take six and putting it all together. And, and, and that also, that scene, which looks fairly smooth, um, there is so much blinking that the Jack, Jake did that he was always, he would always blink. And after he'd say a line, he'd blink and then look at, he'd look over, his eyes would look over at uh, mom to see what she thought, and, which was not part of the story. And the amount of, amount of stuff we had to clean up because of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. it's interesting because it, and it's interesting because there's a film just before that that I did because of young indie, we did a lot of this stuff, not blinking stuff, but a lot of making up shots and stuff like that. And I did a movie called The Matchmaker, which you worked with me oh, on, and yeah, you ended yeah. up by cutting too. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was a scene where uh, um, she's uh, in a window looking at a guy and they're going backwards and forth, and I'd I'd split out the, the 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 frame so the timing was better. Right, right, and right. I remember the director coming up to me and said, "No, no, no!" You, after I told him, he would. I showed him the scene. And he went, "Oh, that's great!" And then I told him what I did. He went, "No, no, no, no! You can't do that. You can't do that. That's too expensive. No, no, you can't do that." So it was. It was. It was an. Int it was a learning experience for all of us. You both witnessed the really interesting turning point of technology from cutting film to digital. And on that note, it may be, uh, this may be a good um, place to segue into the next film, The Pillow Book. I know the um, director, Peter Greenaway, is interested in multi-screen cinema, but you made that comp quite complex com composition back then. Was because out of your confidence in digital film editing? Or is it, is it, how, how, how do you, how do you, what was your approach on, it needs something like that. So I suppose in a sense, it's kind of what we were just talking about with Martin. I mean, this was, this was slightly before Star Wars. So, so this was not, not, so this idea of actually being able to change, physically change characters within a frame or changing their backgrounds or changing their scenery. I think what was nice about working with Peter was that actually just changing the visual language from not being constrained to one image on screen at any one time. Uh, and I'm obviously split screens, those techniques, they've been around forever. So it's not saying, I'm not saying it's new, but I think that what was interesting for me was how we were manipulating this, the, the, the idea of a frame and also, again, a pillow book is based on a book. And again, one of the Peter's big things always has been about that film is no more than illustrated text, which I think I agree with. And I think that that's one of the cinema's great weaknesses. It's never moved on from that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this was a way in which we could actually incorporate all those ideas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but again, not thinking of, not thinking of them as, as multiple images, but thinking of them as straightforward, single composite images. Uh, and then, you know, then there are other examples in the film where certain things happen, certain changes happen. You, 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 make that transference from one scene to another while you're still in one scene you move to another one through it mm -hmm. so it's very interesting for transitional moments and things like that when i saw that when you originally showed it to me i i was i remember i was mind boggled i, I thought that was really brilliant stuff and well, it was really but, but but again it, it it goes back i mean again what, what, what i what i always rem remind myself of that again it's this it was this change in time. And I remember uh, showing that sequence uh, at uh, uh, an avid talk. And um, and this was really at the cusp where some people were, were, were jumping into avid as the way forward. And others were just saying, oh, it's a flash in the pan. It's never going to happen. You know, so in, and, and people walked out the room because, you know, they were so, 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 you know, tied to the idea that, that, that film was going to be around forever, as you know, but, um, and and um and, you know it was just it was just interesting but you know what i love about that is you can take this and within a few minutes this is actually as in you can start using it as an element in 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 an edit you know and that that's um that's interesting i think that you know you're you're not you know you, one is not constrained anymore to um to actually just what you get out the camera mm -hmm. you know 
Martin, you were test bed for Avid when they're developing the software for the first yeah. time. <clears throat> and was the transition from film to non-linear editing, was it smooth transition for you or was it a struggle? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, I basically didn't want to do it at first because editing, the physical part of editing is like walking, it's automatic. You don't think about it, you know, trim here or need this bit there or, or you know, or, you know, or even, even in the digital world. So to have to learn how to walk again was a bit, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. And um, I was planning at the time to come back. I was being in London for 20 years and I was planning at the time my wife and I to come back to LA because uh, there weren't very many movies done in, uh, in England at the time. And I got fired off a movie called, uh, I can't remember what it was called because the director got fired later. Anyway, um, and um, so I, I, when, I, when I went to the, I went to a 3 day course with Avid and uh, it was, my mind was bl blowing up. I just couldn't handle it. And uh, finally I got a job on, uh, on uh, um, Avid. And again, um, I went back and had a lesson, another three-day lesson with a, actually the teacher ended up being a good, good friend of mine. And um, I, later on, I turned down a movie that they didn't want to cut on Avid because it was such a, that it changed my whole life completely, you know. Uh, the last time we very casually talked, you mentioned some editor didn't quite make it to the transition from film to nonlinear and you know, that, that, that's, um, when you think about it, it's becomes like muscle memory, how you edit and yes. <laughs> not, you know, such a, such a big change. I'm yeah. glad you made it. Um, yeah. <laughs> for, um, next clip I wanted to show was, uh, behind enemy lines that Martin edited that was released in 2001 starring Gene Hackman, Owen Wilson. Um, Maddie, would you like to set this up to us? Yeah, this is an interesting uh, sequence that, that we, uh, we early on, John Moore, this was John Moore's first film. And um, I had convinced Fox to do a previs and Ted Galliano, the head of, uh, of uh, post-production over there was uh, on my side. And um, there were a few people going, what's previs? Who cares about that stuff? So uh, the director went off to Slovakia, which is where we shot it. And uh, I pre with the team, David Desorts and his team for about two months or so, uh, this sequence, which when we showed uh, uh, Hutch and a few other, the, and John, uh, um, a few, few of the producers, uh, one of them said, well, let's release this, <laughs> joking. But, um, it, 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 because of because of this previous, the the Navy pilots that were flying all the stunts had a call sign for each shot inside the previs. So we shot one day air to air and one day uh, um, uh, ground to air, um, and then there's there's very few VFX shots. Some of them are not particularly good right now in today's world, but um, on the whole, most of it's uh, it's flying. So. I know that the, um, the, it was a director's debut film on feature. And so I assume it was the first time you working with the, um, the director, John, John Moore. He came from commercials and they gave me, he said to me once, he said, I said that we were having some battle about something with the studio. And I said to the director, John, and he said, they just gave me $18 million. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> So he was very, he was so very self-effacing. Then, uh, then, uh, but he knew what he was doing. So um, it, it's interesting. <clears throat> we had a lot of different openings to this movie. We had political movie openings. We had all sorts of stuff. And anyway, what was the process for cutting a sequence like this for you? For me, it was very basically. It's very. It's, I turned the music up in my cutting room and, and then removed the seat and cut it standing up. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was completely, totally lost in the whole sequence. <laughs> it's 
fantastic. I have to say, from my own experience of actually being in the room, uh, Martin is the most naturally gifted editor I've ever had the pleasure of <laughs> being in the room with. It just comes, it's, it just comes to him, just actually, it, it just flows through his veins. You know? <laughs> and that is one of the great advantages. I think that's one of the great, well, it's one of the great privileges for me was to be actually in a room with Martin and actually see that happen. And that actually informed me so much in terms of going forward. But just to see that development of getting an idea and then seeing the execution and then also about you know 2 30 in the morning phoning the director up and saying you know you have to get in here and watch this sequence and you know, <laughs> enough, he did and it was great but it's um but i think <clears throat> some 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 editors just have i think this natural natural ability i think martin is definitely i mean you know I'm not, I'm not, I'm, for example, watching rushes. I don't take meticulous notes. There are some editors oh, who no, take no, no, no. meticulous notes. Well, I've, I, whenever I try it, I, may, I always look back and I realise I've made the same note about, the, 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 you know, if it's a you know, yeah. two minute shot, I've always yeah. made a comment about the, the bit that's 40 seconds in and nothing else. So you think, well, what's But it's interesting because what I've, what I've done in the last few years, what, quite a few years, is I'll watch rushes I'll watch, uh, let's say there's 10 takes of a wide shot. I'll watch two of them, Celeric circled ones. And then the rest, I'll just go through high speed just to get to know, including the close-ups and things like that, just to get to know the coverage. Yeah. And then when I go into it, I'll cut, I'll go to each individual take of the, the sections that I need out of it and just check it out that way. But Absolutely. I don't sit there for hours upon hours upon hours of watching straight rushes. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're similar on this as well with um, the notion of, um, you know, almost, um, you know, leaving the script at the front, at the door, because actually by the time, by the time, um, yeah. you know, obviously it's, it's, it's the foundation on which films are built and obviously one gets, you know, gets it in one system. But the minute you start getting material, it takes on its own life. And that's why we're yeah. film editors. That's yeah. why we're not script editors. Yeah. But, but so I think it has to come from that. Uh, you know, instinctive process that you actually just have to feel it. You have to feel yeah. that it's right. And I think again, it's another that's another reason why I think it's so much about um, editors zoning out the background because I yeah. think it's just it's in that. The zone, my, I had an assistant once saying, "Oh, Martin's in the zone." <laughs> it's, it's exactly it. And you wake yeah. up and you go four o'clock already. What the hell? What's yeah, yeah, on? yeah. So because we have also done documentary, and again, I know uh, Tomiko is actually currently um, editing a feature length documentary but again there's that process of absorbing the material because again it's because for me I think you know we're talking a lot about how changing elements of frames and whatever or changing elements of shots but there are, there's something for me which is always great about going back to documentary now and again because it's it feels so much purer in a sense mm -hmm. because you know you're, you're you're you are you are you know, it's, it is for me the purest form of filmmaking because, you know, yeah. some, you know, person, a team goes off, shoots a whole load of stuff and there isn't really anything there until it comes into the, um, the edit suite. I've got a clip from a, a short documentary edited um, a few years ago called Mitaka Sumo School. And this film follows uh, Japanese children um, at a small school on the outskirts of Tokyo. The scene I'm going to show is the, the two thirds of the way in where uh, the children we are following practicing at school are now at the national competition, which is a highlight of the film. So Nikki, if you're ready, if you can play the uh, Mitaka Small School clip, please. <laughs> あ、よく見たかにって言うと普通の人も。あと、あと、ちょっと一回それで、まあ、慣れてたからちょっと油断しちゃった。俺より体重が大きい子に育てて、全然抑えてない。
リーの回線になって、うん、それで頭つけられ刺されて刺されて,刺されて,刺されてしくてなんか泣きたくなる気持ちがあるけどでも相手は頭からくるんだとか分かって、あのー、何回もチャレンジしてやっと勝てるようになるのが嬉しいから負けても悔しいっていう気持ちはあるけど次頑張ろうっていう気持ちもある。I wanted to show you this because I wanted to talk about inclusiveness.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, the challenge I had editing this film was that the, at the beginning of the film, you see、um, children practicing sumo, they're boys and girls. And once you get to the competition, you only see boys. And I didn't find any girls in the footage. And I asked the director, Ruben Ventura, he's based in Barcelona, who's also shot this.、Um, he said,、um, He couldn't get any girls competing because they are not allowed to enter the competition.、Yeah. Mm. And just to give you the context,、um, um, we don't have a professional、uh, sumo league for women because、uh, women are not physically e n t e r the, the, the ring. It's a full contact body, you know,、mm. Japanese wrestling. And、um, uh, the reason、uh, the coach said in the interview was that、um, because women, women have periods, they are seen impure, they are not allowed to enter. And that was quite that if you're Japanese, this is a common knowledge. But I, what I didn't know was it would apply to also children. And so you saw the, the clip I,、um, you've seen.、Um, I just did not want to exclude、uh, the girls who w a s also practicing. They do exactly the same training menu as boys. And, you know, and the competition and、uh, the Um, sort of because it was the highlight of the film. If we if I don't have them in the film, I wouldn't be able to take them to the arc and journey of the film. And、mm. that wasn't because of their fault, it was because they are not eligible.、Mm. Um, Society. So that's、um, so, you know, my takeaway it, it, it had quite big impact on, on me personally, editing,、um, having the chance to edit this because. Um, I got, you know, my take was, my, my takeaway was quite simple that, you know,、um, filmmakers and editors, especially, can make a um, um, conscious and creative decision to be inclusive.、Mm -hmm. And、yeah. on that note,、um, the inclusiveness and diversity has been the topic that's more and more talked about in the film industry. And you've been working many decades in,、uh, in the cutting room. I wanted to ask you, What your experience was like, and if you see any change happening over the last few years. Behind enemy lines, I had a, I have an assistant who was a woman. I had my first assistant who was a woman. On Star Wars, I had a woman who was uh, um, my first.、Um, on on、uh, Arctic Heat, we had a, a woman uh, um, um, Sound editor, you know, editing is 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 becoming much more well. Italy, editing started off as a woman's career um, um, and then slowly dissipated that. But some of the best editors around right now are are, are women. Part of this is packaged with that transition.、Um, because, as, as Martin said, I mean, that, that on、um, Arctic Heat, we had a phenomenal team of.、Uh, um, Sound editors, and in fact, Alex Mackey, who's a wonderful film editor now, she、yeah. was part of that sound editing team. But I think once that whole transition had happened, I think that then,、uh, even, th that, even though we felt that we still, I, I think we all felt that we were in a much more positive place generally. But of course, recent events and the, the, the political landscape at the moment shows us that we never really were in a better place, you know, all, all of the. Horrible stuff was always just you know, a mere scratch away.、Mm. Um, so I think that there was, a, there was a failing, I think. But also, as well, there were other, there were other battles. I mean, once when we were moving across to Avid, the, the whole restructuring of how crews were put together was, it was an issue. It was very expensive to do it this way. And so one would end up cutting back on crews. You would only work by yourself, you would assist yourself because they. Well, that was mainly in the UK, I think. Basically. Yeah, no, yeah, that's true. I think what the pandemic did, it, it did show 
people did push back against it when what you know as editors if you wanted to work remotely there was always a pushback you know you can't do that you can't do that but clearly um it did show that you can work remotely now i, I know we're all not in favor i know that martin very much is a very social person wants to be in a room which is absolutely fine it, it's but the choice should be there and i and i and i think also as well certainly i think certainly in some television i mean i, I have i will also i will front load this by saying that I have worked with and still continue to work with the most amazing people. I've been very, very fortunate with the people that I have worked with and seeing them go on and develop and become editors is the most wonderful, rewarding thing. So I, I don't I don't have a single complaint about anybody that I've ever worked with, but certainly you would also get producers that would insist that they pick your team. Which I think, you know, if you're an editor is not not really right. I mean, you should you should have the choice of who you work with. Um, so and, 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 and one does try, but there's there seem to always be kind of obstacles. The film industry is always um, you can't find the entrance, really. This is what's so, so hard now trying to actually say to people when they start out. And for me, it was always it's always that thing about, you know, getting your foot in the door. And then you spend the next 40 years of your life trying to keep it there. And, and you know, and even now, I don't ever feel as I've been actually invited in the room. You know, so it's that, that thing that you're kind of always, you're always trying to, it's always a struggle in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I think the other great problem that we have in the industry, we certainly have it in editorial, is this um, pigeonholing. Because again, I mean, as Martin said when he kicked off, he's, he's worked, edited on a wide range of, of stuff. And... All three of us have worked in documentary, but we've just that we have been able to happily move between them and choose what to do uh, if the right thing comes along. And that option should be readily available for any editor. I mean, naturally, there should be uh, things that one is, you know, one might not want to do commercials, one might not want to do music videos, but as an editor, you should be able to really just go and do whatever you want to. I think that's um I think that's a great learning for me personally as well because I always call myself documentary editor and after chatting with you too I'm like okay I'm gonna stop calling me that yes <laughs> why would you man. narrow your your you know possibilities mm. if you can always widen them and on that note um I, I think we've got um a uh, time to play one more clip and I was thinking maybe the lost children building um or would you like to show me? No, 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 yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, we can do. I mean, uh, what's nice about Lost Children of Berlin is that this is directed by Elizabeth McIntyre, who we all saw at the head and is, and is one of the founders of Screen Craft Works. And Elizabeth made this uh, film, Lost Children of Berlin, which is basically um, the last uh, Grosser Hamburger. The, the school in Grosser Hamburger Strauss in Berlin was the last Jewish school to be shut by the Nazis. And what Elizabeth filmed was the reunion some point later uh, in the late 90s uh, of the um, students coming together and the clip you're going to show and again this is uh, again uh, I suppose the power of archive and um, and this particular sequence is basically where um, the names of some of the students who got lost during the um, um, Nazi atrocities are read out. Um, so uh, before we close, uh, we've um, I've got one question. Um, I think it's about the the fast clip the, from the Star Wars that uh, Martin showed. Um, what was the turnaround time for finishing the two years? Uh, that scene. Oh, the, oh no, it's not oh, the scene. scene specifically, I think the, it, 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 we didn't finish the one scene. <laughs> it was basically it took two years to do the whole movie. Wow. Okay. Hope that answers your question. If we've got one how do you keep? I mean, I, I mean, I, I know. I mean, I, I kind of know how one keeps the staying power going. But I mean, look, how how do you keep re-energizing yourself during something of that length? Well, <clears throat> you know, I was down at ILM every morning at eight o'clock uh, with John Knoll going through his work. Uh, then I'd go into the cutting room and. Um, it, 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 the pace was very relaxed. Um, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nice place to work. <laughs> 
So that was never really, it was never a question of uh, revitalizing or re year. Right. Know, you know, from that point of view. Well, um, thank you both very much for your time today. Um, it's yeah. been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, the time flies when we're having fun. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, would you like to have your mic back? Yeah, thank you ever so much, Tomiko. Um, thank you for your amazing hosting. A round of applause yeah. for Tomiko. Thank you to Martin and thank you to Chris uh, for the three of you and your conversation. Uh, thank you to uh, Brunel University London once again. And thank you also to uh, Jenna Leck uh, for supporting this talk series. Um, and for anyone who would like to come to our next uh, free of charge talks uh, don't forget to sign up to our community via screencraftworks.org or info at screencraftworks.org drop us a line and Rebecca and I can um, answer and, and guide you through to joining our community or or how you can have our newsletter for information about our next uh, next events so thank you once again and see you next time <laughs>